Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, making a chef's knife with brass bolsters. So a bolster is the little uh, metal doodad at the end of a handle right before the, uh, the blade starts. Uh, obviously, I show how to make knives in my videos, but I also like to focus on particular skills that you can take away and use on other projects. So in the course of making the bolster, I'm going to talk today about uh, kind of focusing on how to make stuff flat. Now, that might sound kind of silly, but flatness is really important in just zillions of different ways in knife making. Uh, so we're going to show a bunch of uh, fairly different ways of flattening stuff, starting with some fairly complicated ways and moving on to some really, really simple ones. Now, I always try to be aware that my viewers have varying uh, levels of experience and varying tools and so on. So I'm always trying to show different ways that knife makers with different experiences and tools and all that can achieve the same results. <laughs> All right, before we jump into it, uh, let me mention that if you're interested in doing this particular project yourself, I will be posting plans on my Patreon page. Um, so they'll be available to all Patreon supporters of the channel. Link in the cards and the description. All right, let's jump right in. A while back, I bought a piece of unground S30V stainless steel. In other words, it still has the scale from the mill on it. This means that it has to be descaled and flattened before I can do anything with it at all in terms of knife making. Now, I've showed a number of ways of doing similar things on other videos using a belt grinder or doing it by hand or whatever, but if you want something really, really flat, there is nothing like a surface grinder, which can flatten to tolerances of a few ten thousandths of an inch. I'll be using my new Tormach surface grinder here. I'll begin by putting the stock on the magnetic chuck, which secures it magnetically so that it won't fly off into space when you start grinding. Surface grinders come in two general flavors, manual and automated. Automated grinders like this allow you to start the grinding and then it'll just do its thing so that you can kind of multitask. This is extremely handy for small knife shop makers like me. Otherwise, you'd have to be sitting here twiddling knobs the entire time that it's going, which is pretty time consuming. With this, push a couple buttons, then I can walk away. I'm still fairly new to this surface grinder, so I know I can get better surface finishes than I've got right here, but it's a pretty good start. Eventually, I've got the steel dimension and all the scale removed, so I'll sketch out the knife on the blade. Those of you who've been watching me for a while know that if I'm doing one-off knives, I like to just roughly sketch the design on the blade and then sort of do the final drawing, if you want to call it that, on the belt grinder. That way I can get the feel of the blade as I go and make sure that it feels as good in the hand as it looks in the drawing. Before I do that though, I always drill holes while the stock is still square. Which leads us to the dreaded issue of these little pieces of brass, our future bolsters. There's no other way to say it. Bolsters are a pain in the neck. To do them right requires a lot of annoyingly fussy work. But, as my son says about five times a day, sometimes it be that way. The key to making bolsters is that everything has to be laid out really precisely and all the mating surfaces have to be very, very flat any deviations and your bolsters just look like crap and worst case they can be completely impossible to fit and you have to start over. I'll be fastening the bolsters by peening four pieces of brass rod through the bolsters so I'll need to drill holes in the tang of the knife along with corresponding holes in the bolster stock. Now if you have a mill this is not such an awful prospect kind of time consuming but the results are pretty good. Now you can get all the holes to line up by doing a bunch of clamping and flipping and drilling from this side and then that side and so on and I've showed that kind of approach in other videos but we'll skip that fall roll and just use the DRO on the mill to locate all these holes accurately. I'll begin by sketching the rough location of the holes on my blade stock which I've cut down to size by this point. I'll spot them with a carbide spotting drill then drill the final holes. 
Accuracy and squareness is really important here. If you use a little skinny drill bit like this and the bit wanders, which they almost always do, it doesn't matter how accurate your mill is or any of the knob twiddling that you've done, the holes will not be accurately placed. And most likely they'll be out of square too. That being the case, they'll never mate correctly with the bolsters, which means that you'll do a lot of work and then throw it all in the trash and feel like blowing your head off. I'm a big believer that the extra effort of spotting the holes is better than blowing your head off any day of the week. While I've got everything set up on my mill, I'll also drill the holes for the handle scale pins. We'll head back to the Tormach and surface grind the inner mating surfaces of the bolster stock so that the bolsters and the blade will mate absolutely perfectly. Can you do this by hand? Yep. We'll show some less equipment heavy methods later. Notice that I'm using a machinist's vise here. The cool thing about machinist vices is that all the tops and sides and so forth are ground square to each other so that once you put the stock into the machinist vise, you can actually move the machinist vise from one location to another, as we'll do here. Again, all I had to do was move the machinist vise from one location to the other, and everything stays nice and parallel and square. So the first thing that I'll do is mill the faces flat on each side. This will give us a nice square back surface so that we can make a correspondingly clean made up with the handle scales. Once I've done that, I'll use a wiggler edge finder so that we can put the holes at the exact distance from the milled edge on both bolsters and everything will line up nice and evenly. Then we'll go through the same process to drill the holes on both bolsters that we used on the blade. Spot drill, then use a twist drill for the final hole. Now it's off to the belt grinder to shape the blade. I've made chef's knives with handles that are every shape under the sun. I decided on this particular design to go about as simple as humanly possible, going with a straight, narrow handle. I begin by profiling the blade. Once I've got the blade where I want it, it's time to grind the bevels. Uh, yeah, about that. Mr. Smarty Pants knife making expert here was doing about five things at once in the shop, so he got ahead of himself and heat treated the blade before grinding in the bevels. 20 years I've been doing this and I've never done that before. So all's lost and we gotta throw everything out, right? After all, if you grind the bevels after the steel has been hardened, you'll inevitably overheat the steel and ruin the temper. No, actually not. You can still grind them after the blade's been hardened. You just have to go incredibly slowly, which is what I did here. 
If you ever do this yourself, you'll find that it's very difficult to grind bevels while kicking yourself at the same time, but that's what I did here. Anyway, eventually I got the bevels ground. Grinding bevels on chef's knives is very technically difficult and a big pain in the neck to do even when the steel is soft because you're grinding at a very, very steep angle. Hardened steel, even more so, but we get there eventually. Once I've got the bevels where I want them, we'll make another quick pass on the surface grinder to get rid of the oxides from heat treat. Now just a quick note about the finish on this particular knife. This blade's intended to be attractive, but still, it's a working knife. It's intended to be used, not hung on the wall, so I won't be giving it a hand sanded finish or anything like that. The way it comes off the machine is the way it's gonna stay. Just as an aside, I don't like hand sanded kitchen knives anyway. A really fine finish on the blade tends to cause the blade to stick to potatoes and other root vegetables a lot worse than a relatively coarse finish like the 120 grit finish that we stopped with on these bevels. So make of that what you will. All right, time for the handle. Before attaching the bolsters, I'll radius and polish the front face of the bolster. This always has to be done before you put the bolster on or you'll end up scratching the blade to bits trying to fix it up later. I take this up to 1500 grit sandpaper, but you could buff it or hand polish it or you know whatever floats your boat. I'll also radius the top of the bolsters close to their final profile. The reason for this has to do with the way peening works. When you peen pins on, which basically means just mushrooming the tops of the pins, that mushrooming process really only penetrates down a small distance into the stock. So if you peen the pins on while everything's nice and square and then grind out a whole bunch of extra stock, you'll end up grinding off the peened portion of the stock. So best case, you'll have ugly little gaps around the pins and worst case, the bolsters will just fall right off on the floor. And then there's more embarrassing head blowing off and then we don't want that. So I'll cut four pieces of brass pin stock insert them and check to make sure that I've got a perfect fit everywhere. Again, I want a really nice flush fit between the blade and the bolster. Everything's good, so I'll proceed on to peening the pins. Now, I could also use a little epoxy to seal the bolsters on, but because of all our hard work earlier, the fit here is so good that it's really just not necessary at all. I'm using a cross peen hammer but, of course, a ball-peen hammer works just fine, too. Once the bolsters are attached, I'll get busy with the scales. I'm using an exotic wood called Xeracote, which I love for knife handles. It's nice and hard, and it looks cool. So up to this point, I've used some pretty fancy flattening techniques, but let's show the elbow grease surface grinder. I'm using a fairly cheap machinist surface plate here, but you can use a pane of glass or a piece of MDF or anything that's nice and flat. Tape on some sandpaper and have at it. Now I'm using 120 grit sandpaper and on these pieces of wood, this process takes almost no time at all. We could use the same technique to flatten the bolsters if we wanted to too. If you use the sandpaper method though, some things to keep in mind. No matter how flat the substrate is that you're using, if you do it wrong, you can cup the work or roll the edges or any number of other things that'll keep it from being perfectly flat. So some tips. First, 
keep gripping the scales in different places. If you just hold it in one place, it'll tend to cut through in that place, and so you'll end up cupping out the work. Also vary your motion pattern. I'm going on various straight directions, side to side, top to bottom, diagonal, and so forth, and I'm also using a figure eight. I don't really have to go quite this crazy, but the general point is you don't want to just scrub back and forth one way, one way, one way the whole time. Another key point is that I'm using an oversized piece. Using the sandpaper method, you'll always roll the edges just a little bit. So by starting with an oversized piece, I'll be able to trim off those little rolled edges, leaving an ultra flat center. And another method of flattening, the disc sander. Now, in this case, I'm not actually flattening the whole thing on here. You'll see me do that in some other videos. I'm just squaring the end. Now, once again, it's really easy to roll the edges here, leaving a mating surface that's square to the bottom, but it's still not flat. So a trick I like to use when I'm finishing up that mating surface is to hold the scale against the disc with the sander turned off, crank it up, then turn it off really quickly, leaving it in contact with the grinder face. With a disc grinder, you can't go too crazy or you'll burn the wood. So this allows you to just kind of bump it that last little bit and get it nice and square. Always test squareness and flatness by putting mating surfaces together and looking through them at a light source. If light shows through, you've got a gap and you still have a little work to do. What follows is more of the sort of rigmarole that demonstrates why I don't make knives with bolsters very often. The issue is that you need to get the scale to fit perfectly flush to the bolster. If you try to just drill holes and then trim everything to fit, the likelihood of ending up with an ugly gap between the surfaces is about 97.83% approximately. Of course, we can do a bunch of milling and measuring like we did with the bolsters, but wood is not built for holding thousandths of an inch tolerances. So we'll be using the old flippy clampy drilly flippy drilly clampy approach. How's that work? Well, I'll begin by epoxying one scale to the tang, clamping it very carefully so the scale won't creep and create a gap at the junction between the scale and the bolster. The way I'm doing this is sort of preloading that first little welding clamp so that it sort of pushes the scale into the bolster. Anyway, once the epoxy's set, I'll flip it, clamp it, and drill the hole, being very careful to keep everything nice and square. If you drill it out of square, then the pins probably won't fit through. So next, rinse and repeat, then drill from the other side. I'm using mosaic pins that I made in another video. Simple process here, epoxy and a hammer. I pause here to savor the moment. The fussiness quotient for this operation has dropped about 17 points from the level of the rest of the project. Let's enjoy that moment. Once the epoxy is all cured, we'll finish up the handle on the belt grinder. I'll start with a 60 grit ceramic belt and work my way up to a 400 grit aluminum oxide. One thing to always watch out for when you have a transition between metal and a natural material like wood is that if you grind too aggressively or you grind in the wrong direction, you'll end up with a nasty little dip at the transition. That's why I'm going longitudinally. By pushing the whole thing up against the platen, it's naturally going to keep that transition perfectly flat. Fuss budget rears its ugly head again. 
And I'll finish off with a simple wax finish. With oily tropical woods like Xeracote, Ebony, Rosewood, and things like that, I generally don't add any finish at all. I just wax, buff, and quit. And there we are, all sharpened up and ready for the kitchen. So before I wrap up, I just wanted to mention that uh, I made this knife for my high school chemistry and physics teacher. Uh, she's a longtime friend of our family and a great human being. So um, thanks a lot, Nancy, for everything that you've done. Uh, much love and uh, enjoy the knife. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamones or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamones as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!